back, relax, and maybe get yourself a snack. Me and you gonna have a little chat about books. Hey guys, so I very recently went to an event up in London, which was the Super Relaxed Fantasy Club. It is a club that is welcome to anyone who lives in London or who can get to London on the last Tuesday of every month. And it's all about bringing people who love fantasy together. So this can be authors, it can be just general readers, people in the publishing industry, all sorts of people come to this club. Um, there's quite a lot of regulars who go every month and a couple of people who just sort of turn up as and when. I've been quite a few times now, I really enjoy it. And whenever I can get there, I do tend to go, especially if they are authors that I know and that I like. And this month, well, last month in June, Emma Newman and Peter Newman were the two guest authors for the night. And then we also had Christina Perez, who is one of the members of the club, actually an organiser of the club, who has just released her debut book. So Christina's book is Sweet Black Waves. I've read this really recently. I gave it a solid four stars, really enjoyed it. And I definitely would recommend it if you're interested in reading Celtic mythology inspired stories, because that's what it is. Um, and it's really, really fun. Also, I then met Emma Newman and Peter Newman, who I've seen before at different events, but never really had a chance to talk to. You guys know I'm a massive fan of Emma Newman's work. I've really enjoyed everything I've read by her. And I've read two books now by Peter Newman because I picked up one of the books at the event, and that was this one, his new book, The Deathless. I actually bought this not only in physical, which I got him to sign whilst I was there, but also I got the audiobook version, which is narrated by Emma Newman. And I love this, <laughs> like absolutely loved it. I finished this today. It's so good. I really, really, really recommend it. And I'll be doing a full review of this very, very soon. So look out for that. But honestly, loved it. Definitely a series I'm going to be carrying on with for a while. But yeah love this. And then of course I met Emma Newman so I wanted to get a book signed by her. I didn't have a chance to take all my books because obviously a lot of them are in boxes. I'm planning to move very soon but I did take this one, Before Mars by Emma Newman. I love this book. It's my favourite in the Planet Fall series and she wrote in here a little message for me and said SRFC 2018 London. Very very happy to have met her, to have had a chat. It was absolutely wonderful. And I had a great, great time. So that brings me on to what happened. What was the event like? Basically, they all do a reading from their book and then take questions. So this is going to be a sample of that for you guys to listen to and watch. And I'll also link the Facebook group for Super Relaxed Fantasy Club if you are interested in coming along. So thank you all so much for watching. Here's the footage. Normally, sapphires adorned the back of the chamber slowly spreading in pools of milky liquid. But on hunting days, all was cleared away, save for a single stand of armour and the two gardener smiths ready to help him change. Each life that Vassin lived demanded a new set of armour. The crystals picked and grown by the gardener smiths the day his newest vessel was chosen, taking years and a great deal of skill on the part of the smiths to form it to the individual and establish a firm bond to the body. Though he preferred to be reborn as an adult, Vassin had gone through several childhoods and could recall little more tedious than the long modelling sessions. Luckily, his last rebirth avoided the whole mess, his descendant having reached maturity before the soul was replaced with Vassin's. This meant, thankfully, that it was his descendant, rather than him, that had spent several hours a day wearing each piece of crystal as it was grown and cut to fit. It resulted in armour that fit so close and so naturally, it was like skin. The rest of the armour was then attached. He shivered as the crystal greaves were locked into place. At first he could feel them, cool against his calves, and then it was as if they had melted and become part of him. Plates were attached to his thighs and groin, to his chest and shoulders, arms and hands. He turned his head from left to right, catching a glimpse of crystal wings feather-carved, curved and blade-thin, sprouting from his back. Unlike those of birds, his were rigid. At last a helm was placed on his head, open-topped to let his hair spill out like a waterfall down his back. The crystal was thinned to give only the slightest tint of blue to his vision, and grown to leave breathing space at his nose and mouth. Into his outstretched hands they placed a long, silver-handled spear with a sapphire tip. 
His fingers move naturally to the trigger set halfway down the shaft. Hunt well and thorough, my lord, said the gardener smiths together, bowing low. Vassin saluted them, pleased with their workmanship, and made his way to the edge of the chrysalis chamber, being careful to take small steps so as not to engage his sky legs too early. As he approached, the gardener smiths backed away and the glass went with them, sliding aside to allow him into a balcony overlooking the central courtyard of the palace. People had gathered below, their adoring faces peering up at him. A block of hunters stood in the centre, their spears and wings glinting proudly in the sun's light. They were armoured in leather, not crystal as he was, and their sky legs and wings were lesser, the most their limited skills could handle. It was not their fault. There was simply only so much that could be achieved in a single lifetime. Vassin did not judge his mortal followers for it as some did. In fact, it made him proud how far his people managed to get within so few years. According to his mother, Garda had taken two life cycles to reach their standard. About the hunters were their families, and about them a greater crowd of staff and visitors, traders and children. All were dressed in their finest, a shimmering display of silks and crystal, sparkling, joyous. Vassin raised his spear, and the third and fourth drummers joined in, one deep like the first, and one lighter like the second. The resonance was growing, the faster beats beginning to build, forcing him to lean forward as his wings were pulled back by each wave of sound. It would not be long now. Okay, I'll, I'll kick off with a question. Sure. Um, uh, the hero of your, the first book of your last trilogy, The Fragrant, was um, uh, famously mute. Yes. And in this book, the leads seem, uh, if anything, quite chatty. <laughs> <laughs> um, was, that, was that deliberate? So, um, yeah, so the vagrant in the, who's the protagonist of the first trilogy was silent, and mm -hmm. that was a really interesting challenge to write, and I'm glad that I did it. Um, but it's very difficult, right? And, <laughs> but also, I think there's a danger. When I, when I was uh, launching this, because I only launched two weeks ago, I was talking about the thing, when you move from one trilogy to your second trilogy, there's a danger, I think, in staying where you're comfortable and in staying with what you've done before, because you know that people have enjoyed that, but the problem is, is that then they might as well just read the first trilogy again. So there is a sense to which that I've done that, and now I'm doing something very different. And yeah, I mean, these, these characters are quite verbose. <laughs> uh, this time, you've, you've got kind of a dog. <laughs> yeah, kind of a dog. Yeah. yeah, with five legs. Yes. How does it walk? <laughs> it walks absolutely fine. <laughs> if you want to know more, obviously read the book. <laughs> so that, yeah, so the question was about writing styles. Um, so the Vagrant series was written in the present tense. Um, and generally speaking, there wasn't a lot of time spent in characters' heads. So it's very kind of action-centric um, and very about kind of the atmosphere. The Deathless is written in the past tense, still third person, but you're much more in the characters' heads. You're hearing their thoughts, you're getting their feelings. And one of the things that I wanted to do with this trilogy was, was make a much more intimate relationship between the reader and the characters in the book. And also it was a world where everything is so awful in The Vagrant that I want that sense of, oh my god, you know, you're kind of on the edge of your seat all the time. And I think in The Deathless it's different, it's more of a creeping tension is the feel. So one of the, the influences for this book is kind of the old Grimm's fairy tales. Because I like the idea, you know, this thing about, you know, going off the path is really scary. Going out at night is really scary. Um, because in, in, in fantasy, obviously, part of the fun is that we often have heroes who can stray off the path with abandon. And, you know, yes, there are monsters, but they're mainly there to be killed in a really epic style. And I guess with this, I wanted to get this idea of what it would be like if the monsters are genuinely scary. You, you, you would really rather not meet them under any circumstances. And for the Deathless themselves, they will go and hunt the monsters. But the Deathless aren't my only POV characters. And for your other characters, the things off the path, you know, you don't want to go there. So the question, if anyone didn't catch it, is about if you're, if you're writing on a trilogy basis rather than a single book, um, how much of it do you plan out? How much of it do you prepare in advance? So with an individual book, for example, I'll have my end destination in mind. I'll have my character arcs in mind. And I might have a few key scenes or moments in the book that I definitely want to tell. And then everything else is pretty hazy and will we'll kind of happen as it, and will get defined as I'm writing it. And I think that's probably just on a, when I've got a trilogy ahead of me rather than a book, that end point is probably just much more general. 
I, you know, I know a general thing I'm aiming towards, but there's there's much more haze in the middle. But I like, you know, I like trilogies, and I think what I because the thing is with a lot of fantasy worlds is they're quite involved, and for a reader, they have to get to know like, oh, is there magic in this one? How many different kinds of magical creature are there? What are the rules? What are all the names? Oh my god, all those names! And by the time they've made all that work, you know, sometimes it can feel cruel to say, well, that's done. We're never going back there. So with a trilogy, you know, then then they they they've invested. If I do write a standalone, chances are it'll be really sort of fat and chunky. <laughs> it'll, it'll sort of be like brackets trilogy. But it'll be one volume. She's giving a reading uh, from Before Mars. Please welcome Emma Newman. Yay. I was talking to Pete on the way up and he said, oh, I'm really nervous about reading my book that you narrated professionally. And I said, yeah, but Every time I go and do a reading now, people say, and she's a professional audiobook narrator, like, no pressure. Um, <laughs> I get very nervous in front of people, um, so my voice is um, better in the booth, as we say in the trade. A woman called Anna Kubrin has literally just arrived on Mars. She's been sent there by a billionaire to paint landscapes of Mars on Mars using Martian materials because He's very rich and he thinks this is a fabulous idea. She is a geologist. She is there for the geology. She's going to paint some stuff on the side to fund her trip. And what I'm going to read to you is the end of the first message she gets from her husband once she's arrived on Mars and her first reply back to him. And uh, it's set about 80 years in the future. Um, she's on um, a base which um, is called Mars Principia and it's the name of the AI that runs the base. Um, and there's a very small team of people. I can't believe how far away you are, Charlie says, looking down so all I can see is the top of his head. In the darkness of the living room, the lights of the city behind him are bright through the window, and the glow from the screen plays over his hair. I keep trying to get it straight in the head, you know. I looked for Mars through the telescope your mum lent me, and I couldn't see a bloody thing with all the light pollution. But even when I was trying to find it, I couldn't really believe I was looking for where you are. There's a long pause and he sucks in a breath and I realise he's crying. I miss you, Anna. It's, it feels like you're dead. I know that's total shit. And it's just that it's like three in the fucking morning and I'm knackered, but that's what it feels like. I've stopped waiting for you to come through the door at the end of the day. I've stopped wondering where you are when I wake up. This is, it's just shit, you know. And I'm trying not to be a total dick about this and I know why you're doing this, but fuck. It's really hard doing this without you. He wipes his face, still hidden from view, and looks back up at the camera. Just send me a message when you get there, okay? I know Mars Principia will ping me to let you know you're there. But I need to see your face, okay? Okay. Bye then. The message ends, and I find myself wiping tears from my own face. I knew this was going to be hard, we both did, but that doesn't offer any comfort now. Oh come on, I say to myself. Get a grip, woman. Just a few months, then you can go home and it will be done, and everything will be so much better. I don't let myself dwell upon the dread that flickers to life at the thought of returning to that flat. Nor do I allow myself to question the real reason behind those tears I saw on his cheeks. I need to be careful. Stay positive. One, one of the things you deal with I, I, is uh, the sort of dynamic of uh, elite wealth and technology and how, how they work together, which seems almost contemporary. Did you, did you <laughs> feel a sort of compulsion to, to bring that into your books? Uh, yeah, I mean, as many science fiction writers have said, uh, all science fiction is about the present. And um, this is very much about the present. Um, it's, it's kind of how I see the future being if we don't really sort stuff out now, if we don't really change the way things are going now. Um, and one of those is the fact that there are super, super wealthy individuals and uh, that this is completely unfettered capitalism. Um, and so you end up with a situation where you have a research base on Mars where all of the science done there is all to do with profits and bottom line, um, you know, returns and um, that it isn't for the sake of the science, the pure science anymore. Um, 
and I guess, yeah, I, I did have, <laughs> as I've said uh, to other people, I, I'm really angry, I'm a really angry person, I'm like the Hulk, I'm like angry all the time, and a lot of my anger gets channeled into my books, um, and uh, there was a lot of my rage about the way that society is divided um, between those who have and those who very much don't, um, and how that goes on to shape our experience of the world and also potentially our experience of other worlds. Um, but as you say, that's only one small bit of... No, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, a great deal of the story um, takes place, it's sort of about the internal life of Anna. Uh, yeah, so the, the elephant in the room <laughs> in this question is um, the postnatal depression. Uh, Anna is uh, recovering slowly from it, but is still within the grips of it. Um, and that's the, the kind of the tension alluded to beneath that message to her husband, her saying, I hope that you're not angry to see me happy. Um, because there have been months where she has been very, very unhappy in a situation which society dictates to women is the happiest time in your life. Um, and I suffered from postnatal depression and I wanted to see it in my favourite genre. I wanted to see it in science fiction. Um, so I put it there, God damn it. Um, <laughs> so that's that's one of the reasons it's there. All of the Split World series, in fact, everything else I've written has been the very standard third person past tense um, narrative form. And with Planetfall, which was the first in the Planetfall um, sequence, um, they're all standalone books. So I don't like using the word series because you can read them in any order, genuinely any order. Um, with Planetfall, the protagonist suffers from a severe mental illness and I wanted to root the entire book within her mind. I wanted the reader to experience the world as she experiences it in real time. And I've always had this kind of being jarred out of first person narratives in the past tense because there's a little, there's a really annoying idiotic bit of my brain going, but who are they telling it to? And that is exactly what I wanted. There's a scene in Planet 4 where it has a panic attack and I wanted it to be every single moment, every single awful thought, every physiological aspect of that I wanted to be in the moment, immediate, and I wanted the, the narrative to reflect that. How does it feel doing your own? <laughs> so when the when the Split World series was originally bought, um, I said to my editor, uh, can I do the audiobook please? And um, I had done, I think, probably five or six audiobooks for um, a Canadian audiobook company at that point. And I said, look, I really am a proper audiobook narrator, I promise, I'm not just the author saying, please can I read it? Because <laughs> this happens quite a lot, on, um, so I'm told. And um, so I had to audition to read my own books. and. That was really stressful because I was like, what if they say no? <laughs> I'm a terrible audiobook narrator that's not good enough to do my own books and someone else will do them and they'll do it wrong. <laughs> so I was quite nervous, but luckily they said yes. And um, that put me in touch with a local studio down in Somerset. And together we've, we've kind of grown their, their business um, because the Split Worlds work put them in touch with a major US audiobook publisher and then they got other work and and I record lots of audiobooks with them now and I love working with them, they're just lovely, lovely people. One of the things that's really nice about doing your own books is that you know exactly how they are supposed to sound <laughs> and, and I don't have to spend hours preparing a manuscript, looking up pronunciations, making casting, mental casting decisions and perfecting new accents because I know how to do all of them because I never write characters that I can't do the accents for and there is a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, this is Sweet Black Waves. It's the first of a um, YA fantasy retelling of the Tristan and Isolde legend. Um, it's the first of a trilogy. Uh, so I'm going to read to you from the second half of the first chapter. All you really need to know is that my main character, Branwen, is the cousin and lady's maid to Princess Assault of Ivaru, and she is an apprentice healer to her aunt, Queen Isolt, who has sent her down to the beach to collect uh, some mermaid's hair, which is seaweed used for a balm. Okay. Dying sunlight swirled around her. Some of her countrymen believed it was filled with invisible sprites, 
They believed you could cross the Vale into the realm of the Old Ones through hills like White Florin Mound, a short distance from the castle. Granman believed in what she could see. She believed the existence of sprites or old ones was about as likely as having one true love. The only true love she felt was for her aunt and her cousin, and for Ivaru. Mermaid's hair was strewn across the wet sand. Granman liked the feel of the slick granules as she picked up the seaweed and placed it in the basket. She had been on the beach the day her parents died, building them a sand castle. She remembered how she'd hollowed out the sand into a circular moat with the earnest concentration of a master builder, the first line of defense. Her people had been at war with the kingdom of Kriniv since before Branwen was born. At six years old, she already understood the importance of protecting what you loved. The sand castle was to have been a gift, an apology to her parents. She'd been very cross with them for leaving her behind, and she'd refused to say goodbye. While they were away, she had longed for her mother's embrace, to bury her face in dark mahogany curls. Lady Alana always smelled of rosemary. She longed for it still. Right as Branwen was packing the final sand wall of the intricate terrace structure, a tiny blonde projectile had catapulted herself into Branwen's arms. She had lost her balance and they both collapsed on top of the castle. You've ruined everything, Branwen had shrieked. Essie took no notice, rolling in the glistening grains merrily, completely oblivious to the destruction she had wrought. To her, it was just a game. It has a kind of geopolitical agency to it. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> when I was looking at the, the old French um, and sort of German versions of the legends, I, I'm actually sort of a Celticist by training, so I went back to the Irish um, and Welsh source material. And uh, you know, my, my PhD was actually on Morgan Le Fay, who um, originated as a Celtic sovereignty goddess. So I've always been really interested um, in the sort of the tie between female deities um, in Celtic mythology and the land and the fact that, generally speaking, they are the ones who choose the, the true king and offer them drink and also usually sexual relations in order to initiate them as the true king. And then if they turn out not to be a great king, they usually come back and take the kingship away and also kill them. <laughs> and so, you know, I quite, um, you know, my, my academic work is very feminist, I'm very feminist, so I, I really wanted to sort of recenter um, this legend around the, um, the female deities and also the, the making the female relationships the central relationship. So the relationship between Bramlin and Assault is actually sort of the core of this book and, and will be throughout the, the trilogy. So there are geopolitical dimensions to it because Assault, obviously being the princess, is sort of meant to embody the sort of my version of the Celtic sovereignty goddess at the sort of champions tournament where we know Tristan is is coming to win her for Mark um, and but I, I sort of imbued it with a lot more agency than um, it retained in the sort of the 12th 13th century versions that we more commonly know. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Bye! Thank you for watching my video today Go pick up a book then come back and chat with me again